The beauty of VS Code is that it starts out minimal, but allows you to customize it into a full-blown integrated development environment. I really like the Atom 1 Dark Syntax theme, VS Code icons. I have a bunch of custom workspace settings and extensions that I just couldn't live without. But the problem is that all these customizations are tied to my local machine. But fortunately, a company called Coder just recently open-sourced a project called Code Server that allows you to run VS Code in the cloud. In today's video, I'll show you how to run your own instance of Code Server on Google Cloud Platform, and we'll supercharge it with a tensor processing unit, which will give it access to a massive amount of computing resources for machine learning. If you're new here, like and subscribe, and you can find a step-by-step -step breakdown of this video on Fireship.io. Let's start by taking a look at Coder. This is a startup that has taken VS Code and made it available in the browser. This allows you to access your IDE with all of its settings from any machine, even a cell phone or tablet if you wanted to. It also allows multiple developers to collaborate on the same project from the same editor. And because you can self-host it, you can attach an unlimited amount of computing resources to its back end. The easiest way to get started is to just log into Coder and it will immediately bring you to this instance of VS Code. And the awesome thing about this is that it feels just like the VS Code on your desktop, so the first thing I'll do is go to the extensions and then install the Atom 1 Dark theme. Much better. And if we open a terminal session, you can see that we have access to the actual virtual machine that's running this container. It doesn't come with Node.js installed by default, so I'm going to the Node version manager repo and grabbing the install command. That installs Node version manager on the container, then we can use NVM to install Node itself. At this point, we could install Angular or React and start doing front-end development from this virtual environment. When developing in the browser, you might notice a small amount of lag when saving files because that has to happen remotely, but when you're actually writing code, it should feel just like you're working in the desktop version of VS Code. Now, Coder gives us a couple gigabytes of memory and storage space, but there's a good chance you'll want to go beyond these limits by hosting your own instance in the cloud, which you can do on AWS, GCP, Azure, or wherever you want. We'll set up ours on Google Cloud, and I want to show you how to set it up for both front-end development and also for machine learning, specifically with TensorFlow. Start by going to the GCP console and find the Compute Engine tab. We'll create our own virtual machine with some customized settings. Keep in mind this will accrue cost on GCP, so make sure to shut it down when you're done using it. And everything is billed to the second, so you only have to have your virtual machine running when you're actually using VS Code in the cloud. The smallest possible instance is about $4 per month but that's probably not going to be quite enough to run VS Code comfortably. It's recommended to start with a standard instance with two CPU cores and 7.5 gigabytes of memory. That'll cost you about six cents per hour to run, or about $49 per month if you just leave it running continuously. I'm just going to go with the recommended two CPU cores here, and then we're going to set the operating system to Ubuntu 16.04. We're going to be accessing it on the web, so we'll make sure to allow HTTP and HTTPS traffic. Go ahead and click create, and then you should see a green check mark when it's ready. The next thing we'll want to do is install Code Server, which is the open source project that powers Coder. In order to do that, we need to get access to the command line of this virtual machine as the administrator. You'll see this SSH button next to your VM. If you click that, it'll give you several different options for starting a terminal session. The easiest option is to just run in Cloud Shell, which will bring up a command line in the browser window. From there, we'll go back to GitHub to find the download link for the latest release of Code Server on Linux. Next, we'll use the wgit command, which gets things from the web on Linux, along with this download URL. That will download Code Server to the actual file system on this virtual machine. When that's done, we'll go ahead and unzip it using the tar command. Then we can cd into the unzip directory, and that contains the actual binary that will run VS Code in the browser. We'll prefix the command with sudo, and then point to the Code Server binary, and then add flag p to run it on port 80. That should tell you that it's running on localhost 80, and then notice the password in the middle. You'll want to make sure to copy that, and then you can link directly to your external IP from the GCP console. From there, you'll want to add port 80 to the end of that IP, and it'll give you a warning that this connection is not private. You can ignore that warning by going down to Advanced, and then proceed to the IP URL. From there, it's going to ask you for a password to access the IDE. Copy and paste that in from the terminal output. And we now have our own version of VS Code running on GCP. It's going to look and feel exactly like the demo that we looked at earlier on coder.com, but now we have full control over the underlying compute resources. I've already gone ahead and installed my preferred themes and also Node and Angular. I'm going to generate a new Angular app and then try to serve it on this local machine. Angular serves on port 4200 by default, and if we try to go to port 4200 on this IP address, you can see that the connection is refused. That's because VMs on Google have a firewall implemented by default. 
If you're doing front-end development, you'll probably want to adjust the settings of the firewall, which you can do by going to the network details for this VM. There's a few different ways you can do this. For example, you can just change the default rule to allow a higher range of ports, but you have fine-grained control over how the firewall works. So if you want to create your own firewall rule, you can do one that specifically allows port 4200 for Angular. I'm setting mine up for the more general port of 8080, and we just check the box for TCP and allow traffic to that port. It's also important to give it a tag because you can use that tag to apply it to specific VMs. If we go ahead and save this rule and then go back to our VM details, you'll see an option for network tags. Just enter the tag that you used for your firewall rule, and then you should be good to go to allow traffic to the specified port. If we go back to that port on the IP address, we should be able to refresh it and see our Angular app being served there now. So that's how you get started with front-end development with Coder. But what I really want to show you is how to wire up VS Code with some of the most advanced computing hardware out there. A tensor processing unit, or TPU, is a piece of hardware designed for large-scale machine learning problems. They're used to train AI models for things like Gmail, Google Search, Google Translate, and they just recently became available to the public. If you're looking to get into deep learning, a TPU is a lot more cost-effective and a lot more powerful than a typical NVIDIA GPU graphics card. Let's start by going to the TPUs tab on Compute Engine. TPUs are not cheap. You'll definitely want to make sure you delete this when you're done using it, otherwise you'll be looking at about $3,000 per month or 450 per hour, but that's actually very reasonable considering how much computing power is behind these things. You can create your TPU from the console, but I actually find it easier to do from the command line. So we'll open up a new session here, and then we'll run ctpu up. And this is going to create a TPU node, as well as a virtual machine that we can use to interact with that node and run code. It will also install TensorFlow in that VM, so it takes care of some of the setup for us. You'll notice another VM running in the VM instance list, this one's not going to have code server installed, so you'll need to go through the exact same process that we went through earlier. I'm not going to cover it in this video, but if you're spinning up multiple instances with Coder installed, you'll definitely want to save a disk image that you can reuse or a Docker container. TensorFlow is a Python library, and I already have it installed on both of my virtual machines. I'm not going to cover the basics of machine learning here, but mostly want to show you the performance difference from a CPU to a TPU. And we'll do that by creating a problem here that uses a neural network to process a lot of synthetic or fake data. The first thing we'll do is create a data size of 2 to the 18th power, and then we'll use linspace to create an array with an interval of values based on that size. Then we'll go ahead and randomly shuffle that array, and then we'll format this data so that it randomly follows the shape of a sine wave. So each point will be an xy value, and then we'll set up our neural network to try to predict the y value of this data set. So this is what the data set looks like visually. You can see there's some random noise in here, and the neural network will try to fit a line that best generalizes this data. The next thing I'm doing is separating this data into a training set and a testing set by simply slicing the array. Then we'll define a function called getModel that uses Keras to create a basic neural network. It starts with an input layer that just takes our array, and then we'll split that into a layer with 200 nodes, and then another layer with 80 nodes, and then we'll output our final prediction, which should be the y value. Given the size of our dataset, this model should take a very long time to train. The next thing we'll do is compile the model, we'll give it a standard gradient descent optimizer, and then we'll be optimizing for the mean squared error. Currently I'm writing this code on our initial VM that just has the two CPU cores. It's running roughly one step in the epic per second. There are a total of 10 epics and 512 steps each, which means it should take about 90 minutes to finish the training on this network. That's not too bad in the machine learning world, but let's see how much faster this would be on a TPU. I'm switching over to the other VM that's associated with the TPU, and then I'm adding some extra code here that will hook up our existing model with the TPU. TensorFlow has a variety of different ways it can distribute data. In this case, we'll use the TPU distribution strategy. Then we'll fit the model using the same parameters that we had before. And right away, you'll see a huge difference in performance. Each epic only takes about 15 seconds now. So it takes about 90 minutes on a CPU, only takes about 2.5 minutes in a TPU. But what's really awesome about all this is that we now have access to the best development tools like VS Code in the cloud, while being able to scale up its computing resources based on the demands of the project or the size of the team. Software is starting to become just as good in the browser, if not better, than it is installed on your local machine. Coder is a perfect example of that and something you'll definitely want to check out. I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up there. If this video helped you, please like and subscribe, and let me know what you want to see next in the comments. Thanks for watching, and I will talk to you soon.